Yeah, I saw Mohammed bin Salman give a speech where he was addressing the United States constituents in like the West. Yeah. And he was like, you guys are the ones that told us to push this Salafi propaganda onto the rest of the Muslim world. Cause, oh, really? And now, and now they've left it. <laughs> and now America's leaving it. Yeah. And, and then he said, and now you guys are telling us to retract it? Yeah. Like, he was like, what's going on here? Well, the problem was, is just to put, you know, this is, it, America had a... U why a, would America even, like, push this to begin with? First of all, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because there was a vacuum here, okay? The deal is, is that Saudi saw an... Uh, Saudi and the... In the and some of the, and like Qatar saw an opportunity, especially with Dar es Salaam and these other publishing companies saw an opportunity because nothing, nothing was here. You had the immigrant, you had the fobs, because yeah. you didn't have any first generation yet. It was the fobs who didn't know any better because they had their own cultural upbringings. And of course, they'd already been infected with Salafism, so they saw the converts as freaking ripe picking. They don't know anything and they don't know any better. It was easy. The Salafis were already pushing and had their books published. The traditional stuff, the, well, those who again, went, Why did America push for it? Because they liked that it was divisive. They liked that there was a takfidi element to it. Yeah. But not only that, the United States is known for its very puritanical stance. I mean, even look at the Christianity that came into this country. It wasn't Catholics. Catholics didn't come until later. It was the Puritans and the, and the pilgrims. Sorry. Sorry. Can I raise your chair? Sure. So that was the problem. We have a very puritanical mindset here. It's black and white. Yeah. Well, there's no gray area. That's and that's how we approach when that's how the pilgrims and the Puritans were when they came over here. Is that it was it was it was this way or no way, and if you weren't like that, we're gonna burn you at the stake. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it was very puritanical. So we have we've already have this cultural contextual inclination to go for these extreme ideologies. Yeah, but I don't think America would go for the extreme ideology oh of Islam. Why would they want? That? But they did. That's, that's my question. The deal is that they did. They went to Salafism. Yeah, but they only did that because they understood that Salafism would divide the Muslims. Because it's, it's inherently Salafism well, I'm just telling you from makes the, from Muslims the, judge one right, another. But it's from, the, it's from the convert perspective. Those who came into Islam, because I was infected by it for just a little bit, but especially seeing my wife and the, uh, the group that she hung out with, mm. who, who leaned hard Salafism, especially in the Latino community. And I see with the white converts too, not now, but back then it was definitely like that. Yeah, there was. I mean, I remember. I, I mean, you're I not a kid, if, if your pants are not above your ankles, you're you got some issue. You're bidah. Yeah, What's wrong I with you? When I was a kid, I had like a few converts, and they were like, like they were like very much influenced by the Salafi yes. community and so it's, forth. It's, and it's, then, it, we're, we're and then and interestingly, I met there were two brothers who converted to Islam. This is back in Arlington, and I met them. I think. What years? Man, 80s? I was. I was. I. Like early nineties. Okay. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, early nineties. But Arlington, the majid where I used to be, is actually that majid <coughs> used to be one of the Salafi headquarters of America. Like that was one of the key. I've heard about yeah, that. Yeah, I heard about uh, that. Is the Arlington Center majid? Mm -hmm. That's where I grew up, and that was the only majid in Arlington. And so when you know that was the that was Salafi headquarters of America, and these two brothers they converted to Islam. And it was it became a tug of war between some of the Tabligi people and the Salafis. That's what split up Arlington, the Tarrant County. Yeah, and so what happened was that I I met I met one of those brothers I think almost like uh, perhaps twenty years later, to almost twenty years later, mm -hmm. and I was like I met this guy in Seattle. I was in Seattle. I I was at a masjid. I saw him walking in. I'm like, hey, I know this guy. So and so I'm like, you're one of those brothers, and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said that, um, you know, how you're doing? I've not seen you in a long time and everything. Just trying to catch up and just, you know, reminiscing about Arlington. And I asked him, I said, you had a brother, didn't you? And he was like, yeah, I had a brother. And he, I was like, where is he? And he goes, well, he became an atheist. And I'm like, what happened? And he's like, well, he he got so deep into Aqidah that eventually he just lost his Aqidah. You know, he went so deep without without having the ground, the the training, ground the right and the training, training in place. And having some the ground education in place, he went straight into Aqidah because when it came to Salafi, there was a hard push for for Aqidah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so study Aqidah, Aqidah, Aqidah. So he went so deep into it that eventually he started questioning everything. He and started just, questioning Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Why did Allah do this? Why is this? Why is that? And then eventually he just left Islam completely. And he was and I was like, wow. You know, that's that's when my eyes started to open up about like the the reality. I mean. And now you're telling me that this, you know, I did not know about this, that, mm -hmm. you know, America was telling them that we need to establish Salafism here in America. I was not even aware of this. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why this is shocking to me that, because right now America is like, please, this is just like, this is causing too much issue. And, um, 
and now they're telling Saudi government that just pull back. To pull back. Uh, yeah. They told them to push. Yes. Because like, like you're saying, man, it, it, especially even when you Mams always tell us to stop fighting over where your hands are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bigger issues. That's, I think that's a different <laughs> issue. I think those are more like, see, um, those are within, issues. within, um, like, so in, in the Arab world, what I noticed is that there was this concept of Salafism and so forth. I think within the, uh, within the subcontinent, there was more of a concept of Ahlul Hadith. So you have people who are Hanafis, like in Pakistan, you have Hanafis for, for the most what part. The but then you have, then you don't have Hamlis in Pakistan. <laughs> so then you have, and they're, they're mostly in Saudi. But the point is, in Pakistan, then there was a movement of Ahlul Hadith. And they were like your pseudo kind of Salafi people. Yeah, the war of narrative is extremely important. Oh, yes. 100%. Did y'all see that uh, interview that Pierce Morgan did with the Egyptian oh, comedian yeah, Bassam? Yeah, Bassam. Bassam, Bassam, Bassam ruined, was, ruined him. Ruined I think, I, you know, one thing I, I got to say, like, magical. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> which is very different, as you said earlier, um, was that, like, um, when it comes to, like, in this day and age, you have people like Muhammad Hijabi. This oh, my day, God, I love that guy. You know, you have, like, Bassam Yusuf. Bassam yes. Yusuf. And uh, I think so. They even invited the uh, the UN Palestinian um, and, uh, and, uh, consulate. And, uh, consulate. Yeah, UK ambassador. UK ambassador. Got it. Oh, he's got from Palestine. Got from it. Palestine. Yeah. So the thing is, that they invited him, and he spoke very, very well. He spoke. He he said he made some <clears throat> amazing points. And the one thing I got to say is that I know Pierce Morgan has a job to do, and Pierce Morgan is he has to show his support and all that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, you have to give Piers Morgan a little credit for giving a platform to these people to speak mm. up. You got to give him credit for that. You know what I'm yeah, I agree. That's because true. the thing no is, is that no that. one, no, see, no one, even like on MSNBC, you know, Ali Velshi, uh, Mehdi Hassan. I think there was one other person. They pulled their programs. They, they pulled their programs because Ali Velshi made a, like an amazing point. He said that if Israelis have the right to defend themselves, so do Palestinians do. And then he talked about the, the, the living situation and the occupation that's been taking place for so many years. He made that very clear. And they pulled, they pulled the plug on him. What I found out was that they pulled the plug on them. Uh, they just put, they put, they, they pulled the plug on them uh, for, I would say, like, for, uh, what I heard, Wallahu I've not looked into it, but just probably two, three weeks right now until this whole thing is probably just a little, like, you know, cool down right now because tensions are very high. But the reality is that, man, is just, you know, the, Alhamdulillah, you have in... And Basam Yusuf was like, I know he had he was using some profanity in his, uh, and there are some people who are very like, there are some people who are very um, sensitive about those kind of things that um, that he should not be using profanity. But keeping, you know, well, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But keeping that keeping that profanity aside for a moment, okay? Mm. He made some amazing points, you know, and and then and then Muhammad Hijab, like I just I just love Muhammad Hijab's like aggressiveness. You here's know? about here's here's what throws people off about Muhammad Hijab is that man is so educated. Yeah, he's so he educated. He's an Oxford grad. Yeah, and he'll throw. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. Well, you need to introduce him as an Oxford he'll, graduate. I love and, that. And he, he throws he throws logical arguments at them, and he points out the the people's fault. He even fallacies. said he goes that he goes. Like he going, called me controversial. He goes, "You're controversial too." Like I just love. I just I just he's smart love. He should be a lawyer. I swear to God. I I, 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 <laughs> I wish you went on the PBD podcast, but you couldn't make it because of visa thing. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So the thing is that it's just. I just, I just, I, you know, mashallah now, alhamdulillah, you have people like this, you know. Speaking of Daniel Hakikichu, you know he's over in the UK with Paul Williams? Oh, he is? Yeah. They've been, they've been posting pictures like, going, that man's got clout now, boy. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, over there kicking it with Paul Williams. But right? I mean, like, just Muhammad Hijab and Bassam. And, yeah. And uh, I mean, like, right now, I'm shocked that actually at this point right now, um, because there was a point like when Sheikh Omar Suleiman, he got invited to Good Morning America. He got invited to like some of these kind of news, uh, you know, like on the news and so forth. Was this recently? For, since, no, since, before. Since, since yeah, the conflict? No, no, before, before. But not now. No, yeah. So the thing is that I'm shocked that he's not ever been once, con otherwise he's such a, a known public figure. Because he's had I such thought, a PR personality and now they know he, that he's not. Yeah. Because so, he'll, 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 he'll ruin them. So the thing is, I was actually, I thought that by now he would have gotten an interview. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought by now he mm -hmm. would have gotten an interview. Him yeah. or like Yasser Qali or... He may be uh, rejecting them. That's, Maybe. That's true. I mean, I, I don't know, Wallahu alam, but he might be rejecting them. But I, I, you know, but the thing is that I, um, I was just checking, like, I think the, the, the social media platform where most of this is spreading right now, like there are some like, crazy pastors like from from vietnam and places like that or somewhere from that side of the world they're like this is a prophecy that you know 
What are you uh, talking about over there? Yeah. It's, they're, they're, they're these crazy yeah, 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 evangelicals yeah, 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 are saying yeah. it's a prophecy here. Yeah, yeah, there's a they're, prophecy. They're, yeah. They're, they're saying the Antichrist is, yeah. is knocking well, at the door. <laughs> I was like, okay. I mean, I actually had a youth, I have youth who have asked me this question that are we like close to the end? And I was like, well, we're, we are getting there. Okay, <laughs> we're, there's no doubt we're getting there, but there's still some key events that have to take place prior to that. Not all the minor that. signs are done yet. You know, not all the minor signs are done yet, and you know there is like the um, the the conquest of uh, of you know Constantinople, and then you're talking about the the emergence of the Jal. The emergence of the Jal takes place before the coming of Mahdi. He, I there's mean, like we, I mean, like where the, the news right. of the hearing of the Jal. That the Jal has perhaps emerged and so forth. That all happens before. The Mahdi. So the Mahdi, yeah. So I said that, well, there are some few events. But that's why I've been telling the youth that, look, we we went through this. We went through this. But here's the deal. We went through this is 9 11. Inshallah, we'll get through but this. The, but the beautiful part is when, when you youth ask you that and you, you answer the questions, but you need to remind them of the hadith of the Prophet when the Bedouin asked him, you know, when they go, Ya, yeah, Muhammad, yeah, Muhammad, when is the hour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Masa. And yeah. then he's like going, What have you prepared for? Yeah. And he's like going, to, Nothing really. I just have some prayers. And that's here, why. That's why I've been like, telling the youth that yeah, look, so. just be committed to your religion. Okay. Yep. Be patient. Inshallah, things will. You know, there's always something in the news to keep people up, and you know, to keep up with the news. Today is this. Tomorrow is this. Yusuf, uh, I think there's some pretty funny highlights we can look at. There's, yeah, yeah, there are some funny is. things. I mean, he's, he's 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 but he's. I mean, if there's a lot. No, not this one. one. Not this one. Have you seen this one? Yeah. Say, I won't. Because he's a community. So but he, he was, called out Pierce for saying that the, he didn't say decapitated yeah, bodies. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Pierce's like, well, I never said that. And then they flashed right to it. was like when Pierce talked about yeah, yeah, decapitated yeah. baby bodies. I've been doing a lot of like retweeting on, on Twitter. Yeah, like, I've noticed. I get, notifi- I, I get notified when you post something. Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been posting <laughs> a lot lately on Twitter. You know, like, I'm going, just what like, did Nadim do now? It's just that I mean, it's just it's just a pain, man. Do I need I'm to just, ground you from social media shit? Yeah, I think you need to, man. Subhanallah. Mm-hmm. All right, so should we keep the cursing out? Because the first part is what had me. Uh, I didn't yeah. watch. I, I've only seen. All right, go back. He, he responds to Ben Shapiro. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, know yeah. if you noticed this. Rahim Pazer, real quick. I, I don't know if you noticed this, but he he did. Yeah, Pierce Morgan did one with Ben Shapiro for like forty five minutes, oh. which is longer than his then, usual yeah, then, segments. Yeah. Yeah, wow. he just let Ben Shapiro talk the entire time. I don't even think. But he cuts everybody else off. He cuts everyone else off. Do you know what? That's because Pierce is bought and sold. That's why. Yeah, he's bought and sold. You, the only thing I have to give him credit for is just to, like he's giving these people a platform. Yeah. Oh, he's yeah. given yeah. a lot of power. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's Muhammad also Hijab. because he gets more views. Yes, yes, yes. yes from yes, pro Palestinians yes. than yes, he does yes, the other. Yes. Like Benson Yusuf, I like, think has I mean, like. like like yeah, it's almost like hijabs, man. Oh, First like, day was like five million people. Yeah, how many hijabs? Yeah, is subhanallah, it's crazy. How many people, how many views does this have right Benson now? Benson Yusuf has at least like it has 13, thirteen million in two mil- days. That can is you check, can nuts. Can you check Muhammad hijabs one? I want to I want to check. Here's Morgan and Muhammad hijab. There he is over on the far right. Oh, six point seven. Has more. Basa- you know why? Yeah, because because Basim, because, yeah. because of Basim and his foul yeah, language. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. want to see him <laughs> cursing that freaking Pierce. <laughs> I think Basim just in general. Yeah, that one. Yeah, three point eight million views. But Basim is an Egyptian comedian, yeah. Yeah, but he's also. See, this is. And I know he's an activist too, but he's a doctor. Yeah, that's right. You're right. He did. I mean, this was, you know. Hassan Abi. I don't know who Hassan. Who's Hassan Abi? He's a streamer. Oh my God! I remember this guy, Ehud Barak. Oh, he's Twitch. Former. I'm not. I just know of it. I'm not familiar with Twitch. This girl did a fantastic job. Oh, she Grace did? Blakely. I gotta see her. Yeah, Grace Blakely did, did it. Actually, she's probably one of the best. I'm your host, Mahmoud Al Ansari, and this is the Ansari Podcast. Uh, Imam Nadim, Brother Yunus, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, Imam Nadim, you're from Epix, Epix's very own Imam, and Brother sure. Yunus. Uh, I'm nobody. <laughs> <laughs> the minute you put the Imam, I, I, I just suddenly disappear. <laughs> just future Fati. <laughs> uh, I'm future Qadi before Mufti Malik, the, the, would it be uh, Mufti Amaliki and Amaliki? Larry has a habit of just jumping the steps. So, uh, <laughs> first comes the, first comes the Sheikh, then comes the Fakhi, then comes the Qadi. I don't want to be. He's there. like, I just want to become a Qadi. I just, <laughs> me, I just need the Qadi. Just give it to me. Just give me the just give me the robes, bro. Well, we have a Qadi at Epic. So. Who? <laughs> oh, YQ. <laughs> he just oh, is he? Uh, no, no, he's not. No, no, just uh, okay. This is the name. Okay, I'm confused. Because no. his last name is Qadi. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, Yasser Qadi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. You're, you're getting old. That's what it is. I'm freaking getting old. The only thing that really amuses you is just dad jokes. <laughs> I do like yeah. good dad jokes. I like a good dad joke. 
Like, don't, don't make them too lame. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be funny. Kandi just means judge, though, right? That's yeah, what yeah, you mean by it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a judge, yeah. And it, yeah, this kind of correlates with what you guys are doing. You guys have something called I Ams. I mean, Michelle. I want to I make that. I want to make this clear that we're not in a position of being like a a thabi, like or like an Islamic judge, and neither do we do we intend to create a situation like where we have and a, tri reason, a tribunal, chick? a tribunal. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I, I I don't. I really don't want to go down that road because <laughs> I Others remember. Have. I remember. You know the. The, the the negative publicity that comes with that whole you know mm -hmm. it happened here in Dallas so I'm aware and that's why uh, we don't want to put ourselves in that in that situation but what we had what we have started which is IMS which is Islamic Arbitration and Mediation Services IMS and the idea was that to provide a service to the Muslim community to help resolve their issues in an amicable way and in the according to the Islamic framework. So that is what the idea was. Um, I had a brother who came to me the other day. He was saying that you guys are sponsored by the government. Oh, I'm we like, talked no, about that. Yeah, we're not. We're not sponsored by the government, and we're not in the. We're not in the business to become like all these in that sense. Uh, we're, you, we're 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 we're, we're what, working within the framework that the legal community has already put up there. Right. So and, we're, we're navigating through that, and there and that's why. You, we can go and we can get into the discussion later on about what is mediation and arbitration and so forth. Arbitration is, in one way, according to the legal standard, it is sort of like a judge in one way. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like we can make a we can make a judgment on a certain particular matter that will be upheld in court. That <coughs> that you know that is arbitration, by the way. Mm -hmm. So if two people came to us and said, and they both agreed to go through arbitration, then we would uh, listen to their case, collect all the evidences. We will take some time. And then we render a judgment. And whatever judgment I and Brother Larry, we will sit down and we will discuss. And whatever judgment we we render, it will be accepted in a court of law. I mean, the judge will accept it. The only way they can turn it um, is, uh, they can overturn it is if they have proof of malpractice or they have proof of fraud or uh, any Bi kind bias. of biasness and mm -hmm. so forth. They have to provide proof in order to overturn that judgment. Otherwise... You know, we've been through the training that will, in one way, make us a a pseudo kavi, if you would say pseudo, 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 <laughs> super pseudo, super, yeah. super pseudo. So, so how would this process even look like? Right now, the bulk of you know, unfortunately, but it is what it is. Uh, and alhamdulillah, we're able to provide that kind of avenue for the community. Is that uh, the majority of our cases are regarding divorce or serious marital problems? Um, but people, you know, we, we try and keep the doors open for anybody who has any kind of dispute. So, yeah, the, the, we haven't had attorneys come up to us. So it's usually, why, you know, either referral from uh, the shuyuk and the imams in the area or word of mouth. And, you know, alhamdulillah, we, we've actually had someone reach out to us from California that heard it from somebody from somebody that we were doing this. And so they reached out to us to, probably, you know, for a consultation. And, but the... It's amazing. Some people have actually found us on the internet because I asked them, how do you hear about us? And said, well, actually, Google Islamic arbitration. I come across your name. So I was like, going, oh, good job. We, yeah. you know, having yeah. the name really yeah. helps. I'm doing I mean, that. Though, though we just started right now, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just started very recently. But, I mean, when people now Google Islamic mediation or arbitration <laughs> services, our names, yeah. our name does pop up right away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, what's your guys' goal or vision with this? Well, the idea was... Um, and going back to the time I've been serving at Epic, um, I've just been seeing a lot of divorces taking place in the Muslim community. And I've, you know, talked to other imams and asked them that, how are you handling the situation? Because the problem is that people are at a crossroads and they are seriously in the dark when it comes to how to go about a divorce. The Quran has taught us, فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْرِحُمْ بِأَحْسَانٍ that if you need to separate, then you separate in a way that is amicable, in a way that is peaceful. Now, people don't know what is the balance between, okay, what is a shadari divorce, what is a legal divorce? What is the difference between the two? And because legally speaking, there are rules that are not necessarily uh, in line with Islam or they're different from our religion, our deen. That's why there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of mass confusion taking place within the community. And they don't know... Um, that if I go to court, what are my rights? If I go to court, do I need an attorney? If I do go to court and the system is not in line with our Islamic teachings, 
what happens in that kind of situation. If I do go to court and we go through a, a formal divorce process, is that equivalent to an Islamic divorce or not? There was just a law, a plethora of confusion and questions within the community. And are you able to answer some of those questions right now? Oh, yeah, now? yeah, yeah. And so what happened was that I did talk to many imams and I asked them, that what is your solution? And they're like, we have no solution. We have no idea what to do at this point. So I, it got to the point for me that I was like, you know what? Something needs to be done about this. Like we cannot just continue to live in this way because once again, many imams are going through this and they don't know how to handle the situation. So I have been invited to help resolve few organizational conflicts. Um, I And then... We are open to business conflicts also. So there was a case that came to us regarding a business conflict. And then the bulk of our cases or the bulk of our uh, consultation is right now geared towards divorces right now. Mm -hmm. That is what people... I do know that there are a lot of people who have organizational conflicts or they're going through organizational conflicts. There are a lot of people who are going through uh, business conflicts. They just don't... They're not aware of us right now. But mm -hmm. hopefully the word gets out, inshallah. And we are working with other shiuch and... Uh, and you're talking, talking about Muslim others. organizations, Muslim business leaders. Yes, geared to the Muslim community. And because, once again, a lot of times when our Muslim community members, when they're going through a divorce, they go to attorneys. Um, attorneys are only looking out for themselves, simple as that. And they don't care about, you know, they don't care about balance. They don't care about fairness. They just care about winning. So they tell their, they tell their clients just, you know, you just got to win at all costs. No matter what, the, what you know, the ends justify the means, basically. Mm -hmm. And within the way we work is the ends do not necessarily justify the means. We have to do things the correct way. So if you are going to get a, get divorced, then do it the correct way. Let's do it the shari way. And if we and if you go through mediation, it will be completely acceptable in court also. So who, who's on the IAMS team? If someone was coming to you guys uh, to mediate between them, who would be showing up? Would it be an imam and a lawyer and a judge? It's just, it's just, two. It's just pretty much us two, you know? It's yeah. Us. So we do we do we do have some shiuch that we're working with behind the scenes. And these are mashallah top notch shiuch that we're working with. Um, since they don't have their training, their formal training in mediation arbitration, they have said that don't put my name up there and so forth. But we are it's primarily me and Brother Larry. So whenever there's a consultation at times, because it might come in with Epic or some other things right now, um, Brother Larry will go ahead and, and handle those. But for the most part, it's just the two of us. Mediation is just the two of us. Arbitration is just the two of us. However, on the back end, we are working with few shiyukh, and we are talking to some other shiyukh, like some these these are top-notch shiyukh, but they were like, at this point right now, don't formally add us, but you can call us, consult with us, and we'll give you our mm -hmm. opinion on any particular matter. And we usually get, we usually consult with them when we have like a sticky, ficky point. Yeah. And we need some clarification. But alhamdulillah, for the most part, you know, they usually reaffirm what we have already concluded. Right. Yeah. So there's been cases like where we have already made our decision and we got their third, we just got like a third opinion and they sort of affirmed what we did. Mm -hmm. But even like, as they're saying, like sticky, sticky, ficky uh, situations, to be honest, it's more about just, you know, what do you think? It's it's not it's not about like we don't know what we're doing, we know what we're doing. It's good to always have a second opinion because when people come to us and they're like, okay, this is just your opinion, mm -hmm. and we're like, no, no, this is not our opinion. We have other shiu who have see, seen this; they have approved of this also, so that they don't feel like that we're just right. It's not for, just for, the two for one them. instance, we had a we had a case where an individual brought up an opinion from the Egyptian court. Right. And they were claiming that this was a Shafi opinion, and we consulted an Ashari scholar, and they said, "No, this is not a this is not a Shafi opinion." Yeah. The, what they don't understand is how much uh, uh, secular law has influenced Egyptian law. So it's kind of a smitter smatter of Islam and British and French jurisprudence. So and I was like, "Yeah, that's what I can kind of conclude." Yeah, as so well. that's and then and then they my, my my point that I brought was like going well if they were so worried about this opinion, then go get divorced in Egypt. Why are you coming to us? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, if you come to us, then I mean, we're going to tell you exactly what we think is right. Right. So that brings up a good point. Why should someone go to you guys rather than going through the American court system or any other court system? Well, that's a good that's a good point. Um, and they don't have to come through us. They come when people reach out to us is because they want to have it handled the right way. Right. Right. Because the, 
Islamic, I mean, the American jurisprudence is very imbalanced in that regards because we have that marital property issue. Now, of course, we're going to get some flack for that, but uh, in Islam, there's community property does not exist. You come in with what you like. The husband comes in with his assets and his property and the wife vice versa, and uh, unless they've uh, made some type of agreement or one another have contributed to a certain property or their name is on a certain property, then you treat it as a contract, right? And then thus that your your spouse is now your business partner right. in that whatever, whether it's the house or whether they contributed to a business or whatever have you. So and some of these things are still a, a sticky situation because we're still trying to, and the Shiyuk are not completely unanimous on some of, yeah. the, some of the issues. So we're consulting with a lot of people in, in what is the best approach to handling issues such as marital property um especially when it comes to, especially when it comes to the house because that tends to be a sticky situation because you're talking about people women especially the, the the wives who uh they've been stay-at-home moms right yeah. um for like 20 something years this is all they've done is rear the children take care of the home and now they're saying what do you mean i can't have the house what do you mean i have where am i going to go what do you mean that's all he's going to give me what do you mean he's not going to give me anything? They start coming with these questions. And so yeah. we're trying our best to come up with the with the approach over, on that because I know we're not in the Middle East because yeah. normally the wife would go back to her family. We don't have that kind of situation here in the West, especially here, especially in America, in the United States. So we're trying to find a way to best address that that is fair for both parties without having to leave one or the other destitute. So, so, so again, why why... Why is it better to go to you guys rather than the American court system or a court system? Well, for the Muslim community, it's, it's to have to make sure that, you know, those who come to us have a sense of taqwa, right? They, they, they fear Allah. They want to do things according to the deen. Um, and again, like I said earlier, you know, they don't have to come to us. But surprisingly, people do come to us. Well, I mean, I we think get, it, it really comes down to, I think, so the balance. Because yeah. in, in a court of law, there's a lack of balance. Mm -hmm. You know, they, there's... Um, the law does favor the women over the men very clearly. Uh, there are a lot of men who have been wronged and they want to get out of the marriage, but the wife is then threatening them that I'll take the kids from you. I'll take the, I'll take all your money and so forth. And so that's why, because I mean, the key, the, th the key reason why we started this is to create a balance and provide a balanced approach to the people who come through our door, because when they go to court, they will not receive balance. They will not receive a fair judgment, simple as that. And there are cases, there are tons of cases we have dealt with where she takes everything from him and the guy's left with nothing. So when people come to us, we usually tell them that, look, it's simple. We don't want to leave the wife in a situation where she has nowhere to go. Like Larry was saying that you have women who are homemakers. They have been there with the children, raising the children, providing for the, I mean, providing the sense like taking care of the domestic responsibilities, being there as an aid for her husband. And now they're getting divorced and she's like, I don't know where to go. So what we do is that we try to provide a solution in a manner that where she is taken care of and in a way that the husband is not just left completely penniless. He has his dignity. He can, they can, they can go the separate ways according to the Quran, which is تسريحهم بإحسان like you separate in the best way possible so that is why that is where we think that we provide that better I mean in terms of a divorce and so forth we provide a better, better alternative in that sense so how about for business dealings and other situations why should someone come to you guys why should a Muslim come to you guys and not go through another court system it's starting the words coming out that we kind of know what we're doing because now we've you know we're starting to gain some kind of small reputation and it's all a bit bigger, but that we have a sense of fairness that we have a sense of fairness instead of having to go to the court system. Does what someone need a lawyer to come to you guys? No, no. Okay, no. so the, no. The, the, that's that's a better. Oh yeah, no, that, that, I yeah. mean, there's a there's a there's a money factor here too. A big there's huge. a big money factor. Yeah, yeah, tell me some of the benefits. Okay, here. so the first of all is that you come to the table first, and we and people are not biased, people are not judgmental. You go to an attorney, okay, as I said earlier, they're not worried about what's fair and what's not fair. They're only worried about just winning at all cost. We don't, that's not our mindset. Our mindset is helping them, facilitating a peaceful, a peaceful separation. Number two is you go to an attorney, the the retaining fees, you actually know this better than Yeah, I, I mean, do. it can range up to five to 10 grand just to start. And just that, to that's start just off. The, that's to start. That's to start. Because they bill off the retainer and once it gets to a certain number, they ask you to fill it back up. 
So we're, we're, I mean, we've even heard it's like, it's like a, it's like a tank of money. money. So you put $10,000 into it and they will charge you for every single phone call. They will charge you, they will charge you for every single email, email they read. Uh, they will charge you for every single time, even for five, 10, 15 minutes that they get on the phone with you. They'll charge you for that. And what they do is they, they have this, this cash reserve that you have already put five, 10, $15,000 into it. And they just. Take away, they're out, just knocking out knocking money out. from there. When you get like one thousand or two thousand dollars, then they'll tell you, okay, refill, refill it, refill that your account by five, ten thousand dollars. So there are cases where I we have seen where people have spent. There was one particular case I remember. They husband and wife spent almost three hundred thousand dollars each. Each, by so the way. So we're talking about over... Over, over half, half a mil. Over half for a divorce. Just, just for, for a divorce. divorce. I would have rather stay together. Well, that, <laughs> but, but the <laughs> thing which, is which, that which, in that particular situation, they were just because she wanted, he was not willing to give, and we said, come to the table. But, I mean, for I don't know, I don't have all the details, but they didn't want to come to the table to us. But when you come through mediation... It is a fraction of the cost. Yeah, so they spent six hundred thousand. What's that? Well, that's a that's an extreme. Well, that's that's one particular case, but maj- by majority of them, you're talking about hundreds, hundreds. I mean, you're I mean, talking about close to. I think accumulatively, you would say they have they were probably would have spent around hundred hundred k, hundred to hundred fifty k. Total. You know, understand? I've had women who have come to me and they're like, "We've already spent thirty, forty thousand dollars on attorneys, and we have got nowhere." You understand? So, I mean. So what's the price like for you guys then? What, what would sure, you I mean for usually we the going the the trend that uh, mediation has been going uh, forward with is that for family disputes, uh, and I see I've heard this from judges. So I try and keep my ear on the ground what's going on in the trends in the mediation. But they say they usually schedule for like a six hour session. We charge about thirteen hundred dollars just for that six hour session. Not com- we, combined, by the way. Combined. Yeah, yeah combined. combined. Not each. Not not each. Combined. Combined. Yeah. yeah. We usually have that split up between the, both the parties if they want to do if they want to do that or either party can take on yeah. the whole cost. It's really up to them. And we can uh, the six hours is there in order to effect you know try and utilize the time to reach a settlement because four hours or two hours just doesn't cut it. Yeah. There's just so many contested issues that need to be covered and a six hours at least gives you time to hopefully come up with a resolution within that time period. And if you need to schedule for another session, then you can do so. Uh, there was one case where we've had five sessions. Yeah. What's the average session amount? So if someone, it's $1,300 $1, for six hours. Six hours. How many six-hour intervals do usually people take? I mean, that just depends. I mean, there are some cases where it was done within the six hours. Within six hours. Mm-hmm. But there's mm-hmm. some cases like where... You know, they had attorneys involved, but they were coming to us because the attorneys would tell them that, okay, we have mediators of our own. And when a, an attorney tells you that we have mediators of our own, there's always some kind of agreement between them and the and the mediator, you know. Well, some maybe, but, but usually they attorneys really just have their favorites, right? Yeah, okay, they have their favorites. They so. have their favorites they like to go to and but yeah. we put, we have that six hour block. There, it may not take the entire six hours. It may get, we may be able to whittle it down within four, but we have that block there to work through in case yeah. we have to. It has to be yeah. done that in the, that time. But even thinking about it, even if someone six hours, thirteen hundred, and then even if someone took up to forty-eight hours multiple times, that's still way that's still cheaper less, than way it's, it's less, still way still way, way less. less. And I remember there was one particular situation where I think that. There was one party that wanted a million dollars. Oh, that was our very first case. That was one of our, I think, so one of our very first cases. Yeah. So they wanted a million dollars, and and uh, spousal support, and spousal and support, and spousal support, and um, and the other one was like no, and then so we dug deeper. <laughs> yeah, of course no, right? So we dug deeper, and we found out that you know there's already been money being given before, and so mm-hmm. forth, and. We actually came from a million dollars all the way to like close to like 150K mm-hmm. and we settled on that. And, you know, both parties were okay with that because when when we explained to one party that you've already been given money before, this is not the first time you're coming to mediation. You've already received some kind of spousal support from before. In addition to that, you are demanding a million dollars. That's just Islamically, that's wrong on all levels. So when we had to like, we had to have like sort of like a, a Reali- moral, we like had a a moral check and a them. spiritual kind of like dis- a, a yeah. discussion during mediation that this is just wrong. I mean, at the end of the day, we have to answer to Allah on the day of judgment. So that's when they were like, okay, you know what? 
okay, we're, we're okay with this, you know? Yeah. And I mean, in court fees, if she subtracts that, is she really making more? Well, what, what people don't understand, especially when they lower, lawyer up, is that when you say you want this amount of money, I mean, and you put all that money in the court fees and attorney's fees, you're depleted the mar- you've almost depleted the marital estate. They, they, they court and so fees, there's almost no money to go after at that time, and you just gotta, you know, you just have a judgment hanging over the guy's head. What about the court fees? How much are court fees? Well, the, well, I mean, they're not, they're not, high. they're not they're astronomical. Not, yeah. I mean, you're talking about the initial fee of filing, and then of course, uh, over this, you know, over, uh, you know, there has to be hearings or motions. This takes times out of the court, so they do charge for that. Uh, and usually, what happened? What how that usually goes is the attorneys pay for that, so they just tack it on top, on, top, on top of their costs. I think that the attorney fees are usually the most high. Yeah, every know. time, every time, you know, it's so always the attorney's fees. A lot of times, when you talk about mediation, there's a lot of, you know, built up anger that comes out. And by the way, when it comes to mediation, there are some people who have told us that they're not, or you know, do you allow people to just speak out and just vent and so forth? And we say, yeah, we allow that. We're not a counseling. We're not a counseling service because we don't have the counseling um, expertise or the the qualifications. But at the same time, when if you're going to talk about mediation and conflict resolution, they're there because it's a conflict, mm-hmm. and a conflict does produce anger. It does. Pr- it does produce uh, frustration. It does pr- uh, produce uncertainty. So the thing is that you feel like that finally now you've come to the table that you can actually have the other person hear your voice for the very first time. So some people, they take advantage of that. Well, what's good about that to let them rant or vent is that uh, once they've let that off that, their chest, it becomes a little bit more easy, easy. to start it coming does. to agreements. Absolutely, it does, yeah. Instead of taking hard stances and positions and then you can't get them to budge. What's the main reason? Because it's so sad to see, but the divorce rates of Muslims is even increasing. I think, I think in this day and age, I would say three key reasons why there are divorces taking place. Um, and so, so many divorces. So many divorces. So many. Yeah. So uh, number one would be, I think, so in-law interference. There's a lot of marriages where in-laws are interfering in the marriage of their own kids. Mm. You know, you have the, the parents of the, the, the groom telling their son... You need to tell her what to do. You need to do this. You need to tell her to do this and that. Or the mother or the father would have an issue with their daughter-in-law. And so the, the son hears it. And without even listening to his her side or talking this over with his wife, he just goes and he just unleashes on his wife and vice versa. Okay. There is a case a long time ago I dealt with, but there was this one woman that where every time she went home, her pa- her mom and her sister just kept on telling her, that you know they were like training her you know like when you go home and your husband says this this is how you are to respond and if he says says this then you you this is how you respond and you know interestingly those two people they got divorced and um and that man by the way i saw this man a few years later he was already he had already moved on he got married and he already had a child with his his new wife wife. Uh and and i talked to him about this case and i realized that the problem was his ex-wife because she was pinned against him or she was pitted against him and the mother and the sister just had such a role to play in these in this matter so i would say in-law interference is one number two is especially in this day and age with the rise of liberal feminism i think the whole the idea of gender roles is turned on its head oh man it has caused a lot of problems within many families you understand because now you have women who are working you have men who are working and then it becomes a dispute that okay like this idea we've made this very clear that this idea that even many women have that my money is my money and his money is my money no it this doesn't exist i i it does not exist in any book of uh, any book of fiqh it does not exist anywhere, but yet you will find a lot of women saying these kind of things. Okay, because that's what we're told. I'm not gonna. Lie. Oh, that's it's a western. It's it's, a, it's, western it's a western idea, and um, and the thing is that it does not exist anywhere. You know, the the husband has a, a moral obligation. He has a responsibility to take care of his family, provide for his family, as highlighted in the Quran <clears> and seen <throat> in, the, in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallam. But you know, so going back to this idea of gender roles, you understand. Know what is his role? What is her role? And because of this whole, like, you know, I can do whatever a man can do and so forth, 
this has caused a lot of problems in many families. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I will say this also that, and I think I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I'll say that I think a lot of women also who are not married, uh, there are a lot of women who are approaching their thirties and they're not, they're not getting married. Thirties, Sheikh. They're well, approaching their forties. Okay. And their they're 40s, not and married. They're off, they're off, and the reason why is because there's a lot of men who are seeing what's going on and they're like, you know what? I don't want to get married. Even if I do get married, I'd rather go and find someone from overseas. And this is not only our Muslim community. I was actually doing a study on this, that even American men, a lot of American men, they're like, you know what? I don't want to marry a woman from the United States who has, who does not have you know, cultural values and so forth, or who's not willing to understand that there's a difference. There's a role that a man plays and there's a role that a woman plays. This is mentioned Clearly in the Quran, a man has a role to play, a woman has a role to play. They're not just because a woman can play a certain role does not diminish that the, the, the role the man can play and vice versa. So gender roles, especially in this day and age, and there are a lot of women, I would say 30, Larry is saying 40. I'm saying and 40. I and, and but there are a lot of men who are saying, Why should I marry? Why should I spend thousands of dollars, get married, and then one small issue and then I have to go to court. I have to go, I have to pay so much money. I have to give half of my estate mm -hmm. away. Why should I even get married to begin with? What is it they call it? The passport. Um, I have to look it up again. There's actually a nickname for men who go do that. It's like uh, I have to look it up. I, I, I've heard the passport nikah or something. No, 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 no. no, no. I don't know. It's, I don't it's know. very Western, but I have to look it up. I'll tell you later when I can find. It's not it. like it's a, like, a white man mentality, right? No, it's like okay. a, it's like passport <laughs> fiancés or passport marriage or something like that. Well, by the way, I mean, I mean, I I'm telling you, like even American men, they're like going to, they're going to like South America, yeah. they're going overseas, yep. they're going to the Philippines, they're going to yep. all these other places because they're like, I can't, we can't. They deal want because they want a traditional woman. Yeah, they want a traditional we woman. All, yeah, so yeah, because and that is not want a traditional man, man. But what? That's one like I'm sure you've seen on different podcasts but that's one-sided they want a traditional man but yet they still want to go on i'm gonna do my thing i'm gonna go to the club yo i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that and i'm gonna still do my money and have my thing yeah, but so, then they want some of that but you're gonna open my door and you're gonna pay my bills and you're gonna pay my dinner like going, you can't have it one way if you want a traditional man you need to be a traditional woman because but, it's not one side he's like going what then what i love is like there's like one what are you offering you're making these standards but what do you give well He's got it. He's got the whole package. Like, well, what the hell does that mean? The whole package. <laughs> what does that mean, man? So I mean, these so, are these are yeah, these, I these know. Are issues. Look, there. Are, look, let me say this very clearly. There are women out there who want a traditional man. Okay, no, they want it. Sure. They want a traditional man, but a traditional man wants a traditional woman. As simple exactly. as that. So you got it. So and I gave a khutbah about this. Like I think so. Like two weeks ago. Where was I? Well, I, gave, I, I, I wish no, no, I was. I, where was well, I? By the way, I gave a khutbah about this, and I had so many men. Who came to me and they praised me because I was okay. because most of the khutbahs that take place in our masajid is where the imam is just bashing the men. Okay, uh. it's it's like well, men, you are terrible men. And so I give a khutbah where I keep it balanced. I actually did mention that how the man needs to show love to his wife, but then I took out ten minutes towards the end of my khutbah and I explained how a woman needs to show respect to her husband. You mm -hmm, understand? Mm -hmm. And for the first, like I had so many men who came to me, they're like, thank God. Well, so that's the men. That, what, what was the hate mail from the women? Bro? Well, I did, get, <laughs> I did get one or two emails about that, you know? But the point is that, look, gender, we were talking about what are the key reasons, okay? Right, so so one, was, one was gender roles, one was in-law interference, and I would say number, number three, three is finances. Mm. Finances. Especially when a husband and wife, they both have very successful careers. And they both have very good paying jobs. The question is that who pays for what around the house? And that becomes a conflict. And really? yes, yes, it does. Um, so the I, richer they are, the more finances. We well, because they... See, look. More, um, more money, more problems. That's yeah, that's, 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 that's the way it works. It and so they, it's more about like, okay, I need to hold on and secure what I have. So on one hand... Um, the woman says, you know, it's that mentality. My money is my money. Your money is my money too. So meaning that mm -hmm. I can have access to your money as I wish. Without well, any limitations. Well, well, why, don't, why don't you bring up the, the Sheikh, bring up that hadith that they, 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 exactly. that, that they bring up every time in order to, in order to justify why they have that mentality, well, which is actually, if you, and I'm sure yeah. you say it's out of context. It's out of context. So the, the, there was a woman who came to the Prophet and said Absolutely. that my husband is not providing for me, my children and so forth. Interestingly, Rasulullah said, oh, you know, see, this is why Subhanallah Rasulullah is such an amazing figure. He was, he was Rahmatullah Alameen. 
the Prophet Islam's response was that you have access to his money, take as much as you need to take care of your needs. That's all. So what the Prophet Islam is saying is, in essence, go and gain access to his money. I mean, go you, you go or and she gain, already gain, has access. Take what she, you need. Take what it. you need. Mm. So mean that go ahead and gain your access. But it's not that where you can then spend as you wish and as you desire. Take mm-hmm. what you need. You know what I'm saying? So that is the key part here is that where a lot of women, where they miss out is that, oh, the Prophet is sure. giving her access to her husband's money and estate. Go and take whatever you, you know, that's it. And they, they miss out the last part, which is take what you need. You know what I'm saying? Well, not only that, so, they, they, because she, they also think that, you know, that gives them justifications like going, well, that's her money too, so she can dip in it. Yes. That's not the that's case. That's not the case. There's no the, place in our The problem, the deal is, is that the context that brings up, he was not giving her any money. He was not providing. Right. Of course. So that's she another went issue, to yeah. complain and said, the Prophet Sallallahu said, go and take what yes. you need because he was not giving her anything. That's that so that but the situations now in modern times that's not what's occurring. He's taking care of her, but she wants more, and that's where they're like going. Well, it's my money, you know, my money's my money, and his money's my money. That that is that's not correct. Yeah, and and by the way, we dealt with one case where that there was a lot of financial abuse involved, you know, and so when they came to the mediation table, like you know, she felt like that. Okay, you know what? All the financial abuse I've been through. It's my, it's my it's reckoning. Now, now yeah, this my is reckoning. my time my to like get even mm-hmm. with him. You understand? Yeah. And we have to remind them when you get to mediation, look, if he has done something wrong to you, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. And Allah will hold him accountable for that. You understand? We're not, we're not in the position of gods here. You understand? We're not mm-hmm. sitting here and telling, okay, you know what? He's guilty. Let's charge him for this. You understand? No, 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 no. That's between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds every person accountable for whoever, whatever wrong they did. If he did something wrong to you, he's going to be accountable for it regardless. And we always tell him also that if she has done something wrong to you, don't come here to this table right now and try to deprive her because she has done. Yes, there's a lot of anger built up for what she may have done in the marriage, but this is not the time to do this. What's you know funny is sometimes in a couple of mediations, they've come to us thinking that we're going to make a judgment. It's like, no, 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 no. We're not in the, you choose mediation. We're not yeah. here to make a judgment. We're trying to get y'all together to agree on things. We're not here to pass, you know, yeah. if it comes to a thick issue, we'll tell you, this is the opinion on, this is how we're going to, this is how we're going to handle the right. issue. But then all of a sudden they want us to make a judgment, a ruling. Wait, I, I'm I like, thought, going, no, 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 no. I thought no. you guys were making Well, no, so that's, so that's mediation. That's, that's, that's mediation. mediation, right. Arbitration, it's, it's, uh, it's what we call like a pseudo court. It's, it's court without going to, well, I call court without going to court. You waive your you waive the decision from the court in order to have it handled in arbitration. But the setting in arbitration is kind of it's a very loose format in regards to court. Uh, but in the end, it'll be me and the demon if we ever bring on a third party to yeah. the panel or someone we've consulted with. We end up making the final ruling in regards to the matter. The only thing they bring up is that they bring in their arguments. We let one side speak for a certain amount of time. You know, they'll right, do their opening, right. they'll bring their argument, so on and so forth with the other side, and then they'll close, and then we'll, we'll you, me and Nadine will deliberate. We'll tell them we'll get back with you in about a week or 10 days, and we'll give you our final ruling. And you guys do this online only or in no, person? No, no, this is all, this most of our stuff is all in person. In person, yeah. Okay, but you can do online. Yes, we can. If they're, yeah, if they're out of state, then yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I like that you went into the process here. So the, it just, want, a couple shows up. They don't need to come in with lawyers, they don't need to come in with family. They just don't. the two of them that come in. Yeah, because see, a lot of times family is not the best influence either. No, and you know, we've a lot of times that and we've learned that the hard way. Um, you know, family's there, and they're just instead of like giving them proper advice, they're giving them a lot of like wrong advices. Um, so them, pretty much telling them what to do. Yeah, telling them what to do, and so that's why we just want the people themselves, mm-hmm. the husband himself, his the wife herself, and, that's and it. that is it. Because you're able to, you're able to. Um, you know, really take care of the situation and they can focus on the situation at hand. If you have other people putting things in their ear, then they're, um, they become impartial then mm-hmm. and they become biased towards each other. So that's why, you know, um, that's why that's, that's the situation basically how we handle things. And so we want to make sure that people do not misunderstand. There's mediation and arbitration. So mediation is you come to the table Everyone, every party has a, a, the, the ability to speak. And the both parties, we usually push the parties to come up with options and solutions. Proposals, yeah. Proposals to come and resolve the issue at hand. 
what me and Larry do is that we fill up those gaps, okay? We, we step in when we need to step in. If they are getting really heated between themselves, we step in. At times, we will even prov provide a, a suggestion. Mm -hmm. as, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll provide, we'll, we'll, we'll come up, we'll with, come up with proposals because if they, if, if the husband has come up with a proposal and, and the wife has come up with a proposal and they're just not meeting eye to eye at all, then we will step in and say, okay, you know what? Perhaps you can do it this way. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why we become very effective is because a lot of times they're not fully aware of the legal aspect of the law and that's where Larry comes in. And they're not fully aware of the Islamic perspective, and that's where I come in. You understand? So we are able to educate them. We help them mediate. We help them come to a resolution. That's how it works. Now, arbitration and mediation, basically, they, they both come to the agreement. They sign it. They take it back to court, and they say to the judge, we went through out-of-court mediation. This is the agreement between the two of us. We are okay with this. Yeah, they'll incorporate it into the final They'll the incorporate final it into the final, the final decree. Yeah. Then the second option is arbitration. Arbitration is you come, you provide your evidence, you provide your argument. It's like a court, mm -hmm. but it's like a court, not in court. But no lawyers, though. No lawyers. No, you can have lawyers. You can have lawyers. At, at any end process, you can have your lawyer uh, there for mediation. You can have a lawyer in arbitration. But for the most part, all of our cases, I have not, no lawyers come. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Because okay, so then what? So the in an arbitration, you, you, you present your argument. You present what you're looking for from this case. You provide all the evidences to back up your claims. Mm -hmm. And then the other party, they say, they will say, okay, these are my claims. This is how I'm answering to their claims. They provide all their evidences. Mm -hmm. What we then do is that we take all the evidences. We make a note of everything while the whole meeting is taking place. That also will be around like six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, then we tell them, okay, you know what? We'll take seven to ten in some cases because they've been very complex there are a lot of money involved there was one case we dealt with a lot and a lot of money involved companies involved you know and so forth assets involved we took two weeks on that to deliberate mm -hmm. but then we we went through all the evidences we met several times we went through all the evidences we came up with our own verdict and then we reached out to a sheikh who is an expert in these kind of matters and uh and we we gave him everything er, all the evidences we told him the entire story and everything we did not tell him our verdict and then he came and his verdict was the same as our verdict and then he asked what do you think and, and then, then we, we told him, him like, like well you, just, you, this you is, affirmed exactly you affirmed what exactly yeah. what we what we thought what we thought it is mm -hmm. so and then he was like well then you guys are you, know you, you guys already know what to do with exactly that. you understand and then we call them and we tell them this is the judgment and, and, we, and we keep it very professional too. Yeah. Even with our agreements, it's very, uh, it's 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 very legalized. So I mean, we 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 keep it very legalese. Um, so even when we did the arbitration award with our ruling, we brought we broke it down to the, the statement of facts, uh, the issue, the rationale behind the issue, the ruling behind the issue, the analysis of it, and the conclusion. The conclusion we came up with. Uh, and we did that. We would do that with every single point that they brought up, where they wanted to have addressed right. during that arbitration. We would do that analysis through each of the issues, and then we come with our final conclusion. This is it, and that's done. And me and Nadim sign it, and yeah. that's it. But even before then, in the agreement to arbitrate, we ensure that what they sign before they come and arbitrate with us and mediate is, especially arbitration, is that they have waived their right to a jury trial, and that they have then that they will submit to the ruling that. We provide. They both have to agree to they mediation have to, they have or to, they have arbitration. Agree. Yeah, they, they have to both so agree. So once you guys make a ruling, they can't it's go back done. on unless they, unless, arbitration. Yes, yes. arbitration. arbitration. Yeah. Yeah. The only way they can they can they can try and overturn a ruling is that they have to show proof that there was duress, bias, they didn't know what they were signing, so on and so forth. Yeah. And they'd have to present that to the court, saying that this is no good. I was unduly influenced when I signed this. Right. And then of course the court was like, "Well, we'll prove it." Mm. But for it's but but ninety nine point nine nine percent most arbitration awards rulings are upheld by the court and so that's where our dynamic is different is then then you've seen these other these other entities that have tried to handle the situation that way is that we operate within the confines that the legal system allows us to so that's what sets us apart from everyone else we we operate with the islamic principles in mind and adhere to those as much as we can as much as possible but we also operate within the legal framework to make sure to, which brings us our legitimacy mm -hmm. So that's what stand, that's what makes us stand out from everybody else. And alhamdulillah, we've been successful. We've done over twenty divorces, we've done arbitration, 
and uh, we also do. We're not. Uh, I mean, we're not. We're not proud to do the no, divorce. I know. No, I'm not. You know, like but, yes, we. But, no, but, no, but that we've, I, helped, you know, we've helped people resolve yes, their issues. Yes, yes, that's the deal. Yes. I don't. I don't want any. And, and, alhamdulillah, and we we do other things other than divorce. Yeah, I hope people get divorced. Is that we try to we want to preserve marriage too? So we yeah, do yeah, yeah. premarital counseling. Sheikh Nadim yeah. does premarital counseling. Yeah, I come in on the back end with premarital mediation if need right. to. We do marital mediation, which we're wrapping right. one up now. Yeah, and then we're also uh, arbitration for divorces, business disputes, organizational disputes. We do um, uh, Islamic prenups and postnups, so we do those as well. Uh, those have been successful. Alhamdulillah, uh, that we get a, we got a lot of. Um, Backing from, uh, you know, when I mean backing, I mean support and mentorship from uh, Naveed Hussein, who's an attorney up in Illinois, uh, in, Chicago, in the greater right. Chicago area, who's helped us out with that issue, with the, the whole Islamic prenup thing, because he's got his own template right. that he's, he's, he's uh, devised. So we have legal consultants, as well as religious consultants, who we do. Some are named and some are unnamed. Those who are named are on our website. We just right. added a, another shiuk, and, and inshallah, we'll probably be adding yeah. somebody else soon. Um, but this is how we, this is how we, the, the dynamic works is that we want to make sure we have the backing that we need in order to do and facilitate this the right way, yeah. religiously and legally. So we want to make sure we have both parts of the spectrum covered. Right. We, I mean, we're not in the business of getting ourselves trouble. I mean, no. We've already learned from past history, there has been some other entities and so forth. And we they got, got in trouble. Uh, yeah. I mean, they got... Instead other than bad, other than bad press, they got oh, you know they got sued. I, I, too. I, I, and by the way, I mean that besides the bad press, actually the entire Muslim su the community had to suffer. suffer. Yeah, the entire the Muslim community had to suffer because of it. Yeah. So that's where like we're not in that business. <laughs> well, yeah, we're not. That's yeah. why that's why we try to be careful with the language we yes, use yes. and the names we use. That like we're not yeah. a tribunal, we're not a court. Yeah, we're not. Where we operate within the confines that the legal system has set up. Right. This is an incredible idea, and I remember when we talked about it over the phone, I actually got excited as I was hearing about it. This is something I personally think is, is very needed in, yeah. in the West 100%. for Muslims. Um, I do want to get a, an, I do want to get uh, your story as to how you converted to Islam. I can make it short. I can, can, I'll do this in a very condensed version. And uh, I, I, I'm not tuning my own horn, but you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm different from most converts in that I'm a little bit more vocal and outspoken, so I've be inserted myself in the community and kind of been my uh, sore thumb, so to say. Larry is a sore thumb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he has been, like, you know, you know, I'll be honest with you, man. I, you know, I'd go to the masjid at times and I see, like, people, because our Muslim community members, they don't know how to be around, like, Americans, you know? They're mm -hmm. just, like, they're, they, they've been always within their bubble for the most part, you know? Right. So when you see a white guy, like, Larry coming through the masjid, right? And then he'll be, like, and he'll come and joke around with me at times, like, you know, astaghfirullah, Sheikh. You know, you're not doing the right thing and so <laughs> forth. Give, and then some people will be like, like, how is this guy talking to the Sheikh this way, you know? <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like, Larry's a white guy, man. <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other for a while, alhamdulillah. So, alhamdulillah. So, well, so yeah, Khair, so I converted to Islam uh, 21 years ago, eight months after September 11th. Uh, it wasn't an easy trans transition for me. It cost me, uh, I did get divorced in that process. Um, and then, alhamdulillah, you know, through my trials and tribulations, and I'm still going through trials and tribulations as we all do, that uh, I got remarried, alhamdulillah. Uh, I have a blended family. I have three stepchildren plus my own two children, but they're all grown. The youngest is 20. The oldest turns 25. So you're old. You just don't be <laughs> jealous, man. Because <laughs> here's I, the deal, I, because I, I'm, you, I'm young, you, man. You, you, you wish that you look this good when you get my age. <laughs> look, man, I don't even have white hair, okay? So I'm Stuck cool, man. <laughs> I can't believe I, get, I keep getting more. So alhamdulillah, you know, and uh, so... I, uh, after I got married to my second wife, what I mean, second wife, my second time getting married, not yeah. my, Are you sure? I'm, I'm not in, I'm not in a polygamous <laughs> relationship. So, uh, with my second wife, um, she was a convert too. She's a Latina convert. Um, so, uh, well, let me I'm ask not, you since you're, you're stuck for a second. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm trying to, you know, just for, you said a lot there. Yeah, yeah, and I'm trying why, to slow. I'm trying to slow down. You used to be a. You used to be in the Marines, right? No, was, what the hell? No, no? I was, so I'm ex-military. So I was in the Navy. Okay, the Navy for three okay. and a half years. I got early out, and then I joined the Texas Army National Guard, and I got activated to Iraq. So I served in Iraq for a time, and then it was during that transition. There was a period. That so you used to be a U.S. soldier. I, yeah, I, I, I prefer sailor Iraq. better. I sorry, I did serve in Iraq. I was in theater. I was in okay. theater. Yeah, what year was that? This was two thousand and. Seven. Didn't, didn't you just say though that you converted to Islam eight months after? 99? Yeah, I did. So it's I. So I. I. Uh, I had a uh, crisis of faith. 
uh, shortly after I converted because my first spouse was not uh, supportive of my uh, decision to become Muslim. She actually, when I did tell her I was going to become Muslim, she said, over my dead body. So again, this is after 9-11, yeah. so you can imagine what was going on at that time. So What made you convert to Islam eight it's months a, after 9-11? I mean, I mean, I'd already been studying. Look, I'm, uh, I'm a big history guy, and I like uh, religious history, and I like history as, as a whole. So I, I, I'm a red, I like to be a red person, so I'd already been reading about religions and things like that. So um, Islam eventually, it, it didn't, the first time I read through Islam, it didn't really appeal to me, but it wasn't until later. Someone had made the, the uh, statement to me at the place I was working at the time that they took a tour of IANT, the mosque in Richardson. At the time, they have it in open, you know, they massages were starting to have a lot of open houses after 9-11 to educate the community, the neighborhood and the community about what Islam really is and who Muslims are. So this guy made a comment at work saying if he had to choose, and he was an atheist, by the way, he said if he had to choose any religion, that it was Islam. I was like going, well, what made him say that? So I probed a little bit more. Uh -huh. And so I found it more appealing to me. And so when I made the decision to convert, uh, I did so secretly without my mm. my wife, my ex-wife knowing at the time. But what made you convert? What was that moment? That was that moment that clicked for you. Well, it wasn't because I met any Muslims. It was completely my my own reading for my own reading and, and the conviction I eventually had. And actually, the person actually the person who told me that I should do this was a Christian pastor. Wow. Said that you know he said your story reminds me of Yusuf Ali Salam. So you know I said Subhanallah, that's crazy. And he used to be also like a in a in a band. Yeah, I was in a. That's a long time ago, Sheikh. I was nineteen. Okay. That's a long time ago. Yeah, I was in a band too. If you wanted, if you've heard of the Mad Mum Looks, and I'm giving Sim a shout out. I still can't believe you haven't heard of them. Google them and check them out. I have. A, I did a podcast with them. It's called he he uh, he he left his death metal band to become Muslim kind of thing. So check that out. So what made her want a divorce then? No, I divorced her. Are you divorced? Her? I divorced her. But uh, there was many contributing factors that led to that decision. Uh, and then it was I, I, when I. Because I had left this, she she was I had lost I had a crisis of faith I had left Islam, I could say you want to call it leaving I just stopped practicing and you know kind of didn't think about it for about three years until I got active you know until I went to Iraq, and it was during my time you know when we're getting to go to Iraq that uh, I had uh, you know what they call an Alcoholics Anonymous you know you have a moment of clarity yeah. you know you have that spark you have that moment of clarity, and uh, I made that decision that this is what I wanted to do and no one was going to talk me out of it. What, well, Islam? Islam. And I, and I wasn't going to look back after that and I didn't. So I remember when I became Muslim, again, when I, you know, I, I took it back, I decided to become a practicing Muslim and to really take on the, the deen wholeheartedly and, and fully. Um, she found out about it because I was fasting Ramadan in Iraq. Uh, and uh, she found, I don't remember how she found out, but uh, I'm sure it was through the conversations that we were having and she she and she also noticed the books I was buying because I was buying on how to give a chutbah, how to do this, what are the, mm -hmm. the, the and all this kinds of stuff. And she's like going, I'd have preferred. She actually said this. She said, I. She goes, I can I can accept the fact if you spent money to go to Hooters, but I have a hard time with you buying religious books. I'm like going, do you not see the the? It's like, yeah. And so I remember I was having a hard that Ramadan. One of the 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 master sergeant who was he was Muslim too, African American, and so I was having some serious issues. I was dealing with the dealing with the pushback from her, and he's like going. So he went walking around, and he told me he's like, look, "Look, if you stay with this woman, she's gonna do nothing but put you in the hellfire." I'm like going, "I'm done." <laughs> so as soon as I got stateside, I div I divorced her, uh, and then shortly after, Alhamdulillah, I got remarried after that, and then uh, we've been married for quite a while now, Alhamdulillah. So. You know, I went back to school, get, went to law school, that kind of thing. Wanted to get more involved with the community mm -hmm. with my degree. Uh, I am also, you know, being traditionally training with Shuyuk. I, I, uh, I uh, am training with Shuyuk overseas, mostly from West Africa, Morocco, Mauritania, Senegal. And uh, Sheikh Saad Hassanain here, he, mm -hmm. I also, yeah. you know, I learned from him. So, uh, so brother, brother Yunus, not to cut you off. I have no problem. But, so you... You converted to Islam mm -hmm. eight months after 9-11, yeah. and then what made you kind of go, you oh, had yeah. a crisis of faith? My ex-wife. I had no support in the community. Was the crisis of faith. But, yeah. but then what made you come back during the Iraq war? And what made you join the army to go well, against that's, Muslims? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's another story. Uh, but uh, the deal is, is that um, one of my uh, partners in the military, we were we were... 
in Colleen, which is Fort Hood, Texas, where the arm, the biggest, largest army base is. Colleen, yeah. And uh, we were hanging in his room. He says, I got something for you. He goes, I think you'll benefit more from it than I will. And he reaches behind his TV and gives me this big freaking Muhammad Assad Quran that, you know, Kerry used to do yeah, yeah, yeah. and gave that to me. And I was like, well, I said, no, 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 no. I said, that's for you. That's not for me. And he's like, well, no, I insist you take it. So I remember taking it into my room and I just threw it upon my shelf, top shelf, have it. And I didn't touch it for a couple of days. And I remember, so I took it down and started reading it. And I can't remember the ayah that it was reading, but it's about turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that he is most forgiving and uh, these things. And so I, before you know it, I'm bawling like a baby. I find where the nearest masjid is in Colleen and I go pray my first maghrib been three years. So, and I never looked back. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press on it one more time. Okay. Why'd you join the U.S. military after converting? Well, because uh, no, I, was, I already had left Islam when I joined. Okay. All right. I, well, consider you know didn't practice. You were going through that phase. I, I was going life, through. Yeah. I was going through my crisis of faith yeah. where I didn't want to have anything to do with religion at that time because it was causing me too many problems. Right. I didn't know how to handle my tests. That's what that was. Yeah. So I joined the Texas. I re-upped into the Texas Army National Guard because the economy wasn't doing good and I already had so many years of it, uh, behind me and I wanted to look possible retirement. So that's why I did it. And I really, it was the Texas Army National Guard, which is the, the possibility of being activated was slim. But mm -hmm. then I got activated. So what's your, what's your message to all the Americans out there, non-Muslims out there? Non-Muslims? Have an open mind. It's not, you know, it, I mean, my mother converted eight years ago. My mother-in-law converted about 10 years ago. So my son converted four months ago. SubhanAllah. So, uh, How old is your son? He's 24, he turns 24 next month. How old was he when you returned back to Islam? He was like he was in the first grade. Okay, and you didn't force conversion. No, I know, but he he prayed with me and all that kind of stuff. But again, he's dealing with what's going on at dad's home and going on at mom's home. Mom lets me do whatever right, I want right. to do. She's not religious. She lets me go do that. It's like when I get to dad, there's too many stinking rules, uh, <laughs> and, that, and he makes me do things I don't want to do. Now so at twenty four. Now at twenty four, he, he converted he be, to Islam. After he yeah, well, after he had three kids. Wow. <laughs> So I have three. I have three grandsons as well. He's coming with me. He's coming with me to Ikna. At the oh, end he of, yeah, okay, he's coming okay. with me to Ikna. At and the how end many year. other kids do you have with that previous one? Just uh, my youngest daughter. She's at UNT. Okay. She's not Muslim. But, yeah. I've been I've been working on her, but she, you know, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Sure. Inshallah, she'll come around. Um, um, that's that's beautiful news, man. That your yeah, son yeah. converted. To, and what made him convert? His kids, because he's sick of the whole LGBTQ thing. He says that like, people have lost their traditional morals and values. I don't want this for my children. I want them to grow up in a more sound and moral household. And dad's got dad. He's like, and he, and, you know, I've heard it from my stepsons because they talk to him on the regular. And that's like when they tell me, on, you know, on the sly saying that, you know, uh, dad was right. <laughs> I was like going I've had that realization myself when I got old I was like going yeah. dang it dad was right I was wrong I thought I knew it all I didn't know anything so dad remember remember kids dad's always right <laughs> so now that he became and he became Muslim so you're teaching what like a Maliki fiqh now Huh? You're teaching him Maliki fiqh? No, I haven't taught him anything okay, yet. So no, he no, needs no, to become no. a Hanafi. You know that, right? Stuck for a lot <laughs> Now you can't beat the school of Medina where the Prophet <laughs> Slave some stepped foot. <laughs> you're talking about Sayyid and Musayyif. You're talking about the, the Sahaba and the Tabi How did you guys transition to this so quickly? <laughs> That's his fault. That's his I, fault. I always do that to him. I he always, always he's like, but, going, I mean, mashallah, I mean, like, I mean, I, I, I always look at him and just. As an inspiration and so forth, and I ain't anybody. You know, I, ain't anybody. I got issues. You must have really been looking forward to this, your son's conversion, for for a long time, and your all your yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah. I took his I took his shahada. I remember when he said, "What?" I was like, "Going, look, man, it's just time to take it." You know, you, you've already because the, these are, these are the conversations I'd had with my stepsons that they tell me. He's like, "Going, man, Julian's ready. He's he's ready to do it." And I was like, so I would when we had these conversations, I kind of slowly like, "Going, you know, you might as well just just you are you there." Let's just go ahead and take that shahada. And he's like, well, I'm not ready, Dad. So I was like, well, so it took a little bit. And eventually when he was ready, I, I, I FaceTimed both my stepsons and we took his shahada right there. Mashallah, man. Alhamdulillah. So it's a trans. It's, it, as I told him, you know, it's your journey, man. Take your time. You know, this is not, this is not, you don't, it's not about being, yeah. about being perfect. Yeah. The, the thing is, is that you're on the right path. And yeah. inshallah, you'll, you'll learn, you incorporate more as you continue to grow. Amen. Mem Nadim, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Brother Yunus, thank you so much. I enjoyed having both of you thank guys you on. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, would you guys like to tell... And then... Okay, cool, per perfect. Tell the viewer, iams.com. What is it? Is I-A-M-S dot L-L-C. That's our website. Yeah. And if you want to get a hold of us through email, it's info 
at IAMS.LLC. Yeah. You can find it on our website as well as our business phone yeah. number. Is there a phone number that you guys want to put out there? Oh, yeah, there is. I don't like saying any last words or any last statements uh, on the podcast. For- no, I mean, um, I mean, once again, we started this um, more to provide a service and to fill a, a, fill a, a gap in the Muslim community, mm-hmm. to be honest. And there was such a, a dire need. And subhanAllah, the imams that we have talked to, they're like, oh, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. They're like, thank God, something, some, you know, someone has started <clears> something. <throat> A service of this type because they're like we don't we we did not know how to handle this now that you know how to handle this and you had you have your you know you have a good grip on this we're just going to send you all yeah, the cases just, and no. they're like yeah that's fine you know? and i made my go arounds again with all the shoe yeah, so, so. alhamdulillah so the number of uh, our business number other than the email is it's six eight two three two five seven two three eight you can reach us there too. Sure. I and I and I do my best to respond to every email. And, Larry is very good at responding to emails. Phone calls. And, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you guys for coming on. Make the offer. Thank you guys for listening to the Unsolid podcast. Yes, sir. Okay. Like cool. Thank you. Thank to you guys. This is awesome. Let's take a picture real quick because yeah. that's Excellent. something I always forget. Yeah. <laughs> I try not to. I got to rush back. I'm going to drive like a crazy man. Crazy man. Don't be pulled over, sir. Yeah, I know. Especially since, you know, you got something on your head, brown, big beard, I would arrest you on the spot. You're from the Hamas group, aren't you? You support the Hamas people. Crazy Muslims.